Hi, welcome to this Kickstarter preview video about Endless Winter Paleo Americans. This is a brand new game from a fresh publisher, which actually uh, is Fantasia Games, and they look like they have been uh, in the scene for quite some time now because they have shown very, very well signs of great publishers with a lot of experience and uh, picking the best collaborators to introduce this brand new game. Now, I'm going to show you how the game plays. I'm going to make a full how to play video about the game, uh, share you my uh, initial thoughts about the game. I had the chance and the privilege to play the game uh, several times so far. I also played on a, a tabletop simulator, so I have done this some months ago when it was uh, also during uh, uh, at the end of the development because it's fully developed for many, many months, uh, this game. I don't remember how much, but uh, I've heard it even from last year. So there are many cool names involved, uh, both in the development, also in the uh, designing, uh, in the art, in uh, the final production. So Fantasia Games has managed to pick up the best of the best, the cream of the cream, to produce this game, both from design and from final execution. If you visit their Kickstarter campaign, you'll get exactly what I mean uh, with just going through, scrolling through their uh, page. Now, what this game is about, we're a bunch of uh, a tribe, uh, uh, members. We're actually playing uh, the chief of one of those tribes. So we're trying to make our tribe uh, prosper, develop and expand throughout uh, the generations over a course of four generations, which are the four rounds of the game, in order to gain uh, cultural advancements, uh, gain abilities, uh, invent things, invent uh, tools, mechanisms, uh, different things that actually are in the early stage of the civilization that they will develop in the later in a flourished and a really established and successful tribe. So we start at 10,000, around 2000 BC. We start from a basic hunters with no uh, enough things to move around and just need to get, gather food to gather basic concepts and basic tools for our everyday survival. And then through the course of the game, through the course of four generations, we'll become stronger, uh, more clever, more capable, and we'll start uh, the story and the history as we know it nowadays in the storybooks. So, this is a Euro game that blends smoothly worker placement and deck building, but that's not the first time that we have seen this in a game. Uh, nowadays, uh, the publishers and the game designers have a very difficult task to invent or design or bring to the table something fresh and innovative, but uh, they have managed to do that here because this is a very, very cleverly designed game. Uh, while I was playing it on the first time on TTS, the tabletop simulator that is, with, uh, with my friends and uh, the, the, the publishers, I was under my, uh, really my jaw just dropped because I was thinking, oh my god, this is a great idea. And then we play a little bit and then I, I realize how this mechanism works and how the different things interconnect with each other and I say, oh my god, this is brilliant. I can't wait for this to be published. And now it is the time for the game to be published. So if you want to support this game, visit them at the Kickstarter campaign. The campaign is already successful. The thing is, if you want to get on board on a successful story, I think that's the time now to do it. So, uh, I'm going to spoil right ahead my final opinion about the game, which I'm going to summarize at the end of this video, after the rules explanation, uh, which is really wow. We're going into a lockdown, a second lockdown with a quarantine, and I hope everyone is safe and okay. But this is one of the games that I would have liked to have it with me as a final copy going into, um, uh, you know, staying away from uh, going outside or keeping or selecting a few, just a few games to take with me somewhere to be safe, etc. If uh, a boat was sinking and I had to throw some uh, board games outside the boat, this is not going to be one of the games that are going to be thrown outside the boat. They will be staying with me on the boat. And that's what I mean. This is such a brilliantly clever design game. I'm fascinated about it. I can't wait to get the final production and uh, it will be one of the most common games that we play in my gaming group. But you'll see for yourselves. Now, join me at the table. I'll show you how the game works. I will be very, very detailed and very extensive so you can replace the rulebook and just get everything from uh, this video explanation. See how the game plays. And uh, we're going to come back at the end of this video for a final opinion, which of course you understand, I'm super, super excited about this game and uh, what was the feeling of all the players that were involved and played with me and what are, were our first impressions. Also, we'll try to make a second video with uh, some playthrough to show you in practice how the game plays and this will be a separate video uh, that will be published soon. So, join me at the table, see how the game works and we'll be back after a few minutes with the final opinion. Uh, 
Together is set in North America during the early stages of human expansion, around 10,000 BC. Players will lead their tribes over several generations, and the game is played over four rounds that you can see here. This is the first round, and each round depicts one subsequent generation. Tribes can discover and settle new lands that you see over here, and expand, grow their populations, master the hunting, and of course build everlasting megalithic structures over here. Let's go through the setup of the game, which is very simple and I have done some steps to save some time for this video. First of all, we start with the main board that we assemble and unfold and put it here in the middle of the table. Then we place the animal board uh, close to the main area. This is the animal board where you're going to find different animals. And lastly, we have the idle board, which is over here and has two tracks, one on the left and one on the right that we're going to come back and explain soon. What we do next is we place the round marker on the leftmost space of the round track, starting with round one over here. And we shuffle the sacred stones. These are the stones that they look like that. And from the opposite side, you have different possibilities to score various victory points, uh, depending on the condition met. We're going to place a specific amount of sacred stones on these slots, depending on the number of players as you can see, and in a four player game that I have set up here, we're also going to use the ones on the top. That's why you have the four player icon behind this um, token. So essentially we shuffle all of them and put them face up on each sacred stone, stone uh, spot. If we play four players, all 12 of them will be used. There will be some uh, remaining that they're going to be uh, returned to the box and uh, they're used only for replayability purposes. So if we're playing a two or three player game, well, we're only going to have eight of those in the second row. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Next, we sort out the tribe cards into five decks according to their type, and each tribe deck should have 12 identical cards, the same cards in each deck. We place them face up below the main board in the respective matching cases. So you see, for example, these are the starting cards that you see here. These are the starting tribe cards. All of those are the same. This is just a deck so you can get more uh, hunters if you wish or more pathfinders from this deck which have special um, function and enhance specific aspects of the game. More crafters, more elders, and finally, more shamans, which are here. Each of those, as mentioned, have a specific icon that you can find on top of the card. For example, the elder has the elder icon that you can see here for purposes of iconography. And this is located also on the respective slot, so you know where you put the crafters, the pathfinders, the hunters, etc. So we sort out this for supply in face-up decks, so players can get more tribe members if they choose so from the respective deck during the game. Next, we sort the culture decks. Accordingly, we have two culture cards. First of all, we have the culture cards with... All the culture cards have, first of all, this uh, uh, back iconography. So, the culture cards have different uh, iconography and art. Of course, they're not tribe members, as you can see here. And they have also an icon here that they depict, first of all, that they are culture cards and they belong to the deck of era one. So we start with those. And the second deck of cards has era two cards that they are shuffled and put face down here below the era one. So era one and era two. On top of the era two, we're going to position this card as a reminder that I'm going to explain later on. Next, what we do is from the shuffled uh, culture card, we take from the respective era, era one, the number of cards to fill in the slots as you see here. So all of these cards belong to this deck, which are culture uh, cards era one. And they all have one in the respective uh, section to indicate they belong in era one. Next, what we do is say we deal the top eight cards that I have told you here to put them face up. And we uh, move to the player setup. Each player is going to take one of their boards and all of the pieces in their colors. So they get one resource marker and they put it on the leftmost space of their food truck. This is the food truck here, so we put it here. And then we take one more resource cube and we put it in uh, the leftmost space for our tools. 
Keep in mind that these are prototypes, but still they're going to be recessed boards, which make it very easy to track different amounts of uh, food or tools within the game, as long as pick up the different uh, villages, tents, uh, megaliths, etc. So this is very, very useful. So the players are going to take uh, their uh, starting cards. Each player is going to take the same starting deck. Their starting deck is exactly consisted of nine cards. They are going to have tribe members. All of them are going to have the same tribe members. They're going to get an altar, they're going to get a feast card, and they're going to get a brave card. The rest of the cards are going to be tribe members, which are uh, with the same iconography, and they're the basic starting cards for your starting deck. So your starting deck goes on the left, and there is a reminder here that when you draw, you draw five cards. Uh, we'll see later on when this happens. So on the left, you're going to have your deck from where you take cards and put them in your hand. In uh, example, uh, you're going to get, of course, uh, besides those cards, your respective villages. That uh, These are 3D printed and they look very nice, but uh, the final production copy is going to have gorgeous gorgeous minis. So these are located in the circular slots here. We have three villages that we're going to insert here and they start on the board. Of course we get six camps that they look like tents and they're going to be used throughout the game on this uh, area and they're going to be migrated from space to space depending on what we're uh, looking for and what we're chasing and we're going to position them here according to the rulebook. Then we get, um, I think they're going to be five not six so one, two, three, four, five, yes, and one is going to be starting here, if I'm not mistaken. But in any way, the final rulebook will have exactly the details. Next, we're going to take eight megaliths of your color. So we're going to put them here. Those megaliths have this, they're just flat um, uh, chunks of uh, megalith. Uh, I think they're going to have some resin fantastic ones as well that they look gorgeous. I've seen it already as an add-on on their Kickstarter campaign, uh, campaign page. So they're going to take two of those and put in each of the slots, starting from the second, third, um, fourth, so in total, two times four, eight megaliths in your color, plus two neutral ones, they're going to be gray, and each player they're going to put the neutral ones in the first slot, as I'm showing you now. You see, the same for the orange player. Next, we're going to take one uh, chief figure, with the respective chief base attached, and two tribe figures that we're going to put on the right of our player board. Uh, for the moment I have them here, but of course this is just to have a condensed view for the video. Uh, you need to have more space in front of you to spread them. So, these are the tribe members. The tribe figures, essentially are workers. Uh, each player, again, they're going to have fantastic wooden custom components depending or on their uh, specific workers, but essentially they act the same. And the third one is the chief, that they're going to have the base, the plastic base, and a miniature. Again, this is 3D printed. The final production copy uh, will have fantastic minis uh, that they're going to show all the detail nicely. Uh, the chief mini is going to be attached to the base of the respective player's color, so that essentially each player has three workers. Out of those, one is a special worker with um, the chief abilities that they are depicted on the chief card that they get as well. You see, this is the chief task breaker. Yeah, he has a special ability here. The back just indicates the, the same iconography, the same art. And uh, when, for example, this uh, special worker is used for this exactly action here in this column, they're going to have plus one um, additional labor. We're going to explain later on. This one needs to be placed somewhere on the left. For the moment, I'm placing it here. This is a discard section where when you play cards and you take them from uh, your playing area here, you're going to move them here to the discard part. Uh, so this is very tidy and very nice with the slots, but for the moment, for saving space, I'm putting it here. Keep in mind here is going to be your discard pile. The next thing that we're going to do is uh, we're going to take, of course, additionally, uh, the markers for the victory points. Each player is going to position their marker on the zero spot. This is a victory point track that goes around the table. If you go beyond 100 points, then you're going to take, respectively, the 100 point and put it here, so you remember that you go, are above 100 points, victory points that is. And the last thing that you need to do is you need to have one respective uh, token in your color in each of those idle tracks, one on the left and one on the right. You see, each player has one specific marker here. Last but not least, each player is going to take as a starting 
uh, amount of resources based on the cards that they're going to draw. Keep in mind that these are player rates which explain all the different steps from the back. But before moving to the player state and player aid um, section, these have some starting benefits. So they're randomizers for starting resources. For example, this player is going to pick up one Pathfinder, meaning one card of here. Plus, they're going to find from the deck of animals one Sacred Tooth Tiger and put it here. Below, here it means below where they sl uh, slot uh, their animals hunted, orientated facing up, meaning not tapped. Plus, three food and one tool. So they're going to take one, two, three food and one tool and indicate the amount of starting resources they have. Also, they get to position one of their um, uh, camps as well. You can see that they're going to be different type of starting resources, which are balanced and give a variability in starting with some different amount of resources. Moving forward, this doesn't matter, you're just going to flip it and use it as a play rate, where it summarizes a turn summary, the reveal eclipse pile, and the different final scoring opportunities for the game. So, let's now move to the remaining um, setup in the game. The last thing that we need to do is we need uh, to take the player board with animal cards, take the deck with animal cards that you can see here. These are the animal cards and there are many, many nice <laughs> illustrations here, different type of animals that uh, when you acquire they can even be used during the game uh, for uh, uh, getting meat that you need, food essentially, or they can be used for set collection if they're not used for meat uh, at the end of the game. And this gives different possibilities for various scoring with the set collection. We're going to shuffle this deck of cards, put it here, and open a number of cards equal to the number of players for starting. Last, uh, we're going to use the labor tokens and put them at the side as a pile. We're going to assemble this structure here where we're going to be positioning gradually on the slots our megaliths in order to create the structure. So this is assembled in various ways and this is an interesting um, example of using your components in an excellent way. You can combine it like that or do different combinations. They are described in the rulebook. So each time you can have a different a mini board with specific sections to slot your uh, megaliths on there to make them a uh, structure at the end. Uh, we're going to explain how this works, so don't worry for the moment. The last thing that we need to uh, arrange is the terrain board that you see here. We start first of all with uh, the base, the terrain base, which is our uh, main starting point. This is the style. Each player is going to take the leftmost uh, camp and put it here as a starting token. And then we're going to build them up where we're going to expand, explore and uh, potentially exploit getting more resources and more benefits. So what we do is we place the base terrain tile in the main section. From there, from the land terrain tiles, we take one of each of the six different types. The types are located here, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we take uh, six of those, not counting the glaciers, which are those. And what we do is uh, we sort them out, we shuffle them, and uh, we uh, start constructing the main map. So before doing that, we need, first of all, to make sure that we have the correct amount of tiles. So with two players, we start in, in any combination of players, either we're playing two, three or four, we start with the six fixed tiles that I mentioned, one from each of the categories. Then we add, depending on the number of players, if we're playing with two players, nine, if we're playing with three players, six, and if we're playing with four players, three glacier tiles that you can see here. And then we add on top of that additional terrain tiles and shuffle them all together to create the final mix of terrain tiles that we construct our map. Just to avoid any confusion, in order of saving space, this map that I set up here is for three players, not for four players. So to be fair, this is for just three players because I have used exactly six uh, glaciers. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six starting tiles, one of each category. The main section that we start from and three um, additional and, uh, and uh, three additional tiles 
uh, sorry, six additional tires, so that's six plus six plus six, 18 in total. In any case, whatever the combination, it needs to be 18 in total. Meaning that if we were playing with four players, I would replace three of those with terrain tiles instead of glaciers. So I'd have only three glaciers with four players and the rest would, glaciers would be replaced with additional terrain tiles. So don't be confused, this setup is for three players. Just to fit it, um, this is the way I set it up, so not waste time to actually uh, redo it again. This is fine for three players in terms of map. If I was to use four players, I would take out three of those and add uh, different terrain types so only three glaciers would be present. Okay, fair enough. Now, how do we play the game? The game is played over four rounds and each of those is represented by a generation I have told you at the beginning of this video, which are counted here, one all the way to four. Keep in mind that each round is divided in three phases. We have the action phase where in turn order players take turns until they have three turns each and you can see the turns with the respective pieces. Each player has three pieces, as you can see. Then we have the eclipse phase, which is in between turns. As you can see, we go from the action phase to the eclipse phase, and then we go to the uh, preparation phase. And then again, with the new action phase, new eclipse phase, preparation phase, etc. Here is a reminder that you need to use uh, type two era cards for the tribe cards. So, in the action phase, in turn order players take turns until all they have three turns in total. In the eclipse phase, again in turn order, uh, it is adjusted uh, with the new cards that we're going to present from the eclipse slot. And this is very important because this is where we talk about turn order. This is a starting turn order, as you can see, that we start with. And during the eclipse phase, one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to set the new turn order here, and it is very important. And uh, we're going to take Eclipse actions in the new third order. And of course, then we have the preparation phase where we reset the boards, we draw more cards, we reset things and we move to the next round respectively. After the fourth Eclipse phase, the game proceeds directly to the scoring. We're not going to have a preparation because the game ends with the last, the fourth and last Eclipse phase. And then we move to final scoring. There are some important key aspects that we need to remember with uh, endless winter, but there's nothing difficult in the rules. So first of all, we talk about the deck. This is our deck. It starts with specific amount of starting cards and through the game, because this is a deck building, we're going to acquire more cards, either tribe members to help us with actions or cultural cards to help us with different aspects, bonuses, plus a, a important boost that we need in order to make more meaningful turns. So at any point, the cards that you have and you use are here. This is your drawing deck, as you can see on the left, and it has uh, the deck icon here. Whenever your deck is empty, at any point, if you need to draw a card from your deck and it is empty, you need to shuffle your discard pile, which is going to be here. Forget about the chief card. This is going to be the played, uh, opened and discarded uh, cards from our deck. So we're going to shuffle our discard pile and draw uh, the remaining cards that were still missing and then put the remaining cards face down as a, a future drawing deck for us. So for example, if I need to draw five cards, but there are only two, uh, I'm going to draw those two, shuffle my discard pile, draw another three to bring my total in five, because I draw five cards, as you'll see later on, and then put the rest of uh, the shuffled face down cards here for future drawing. Now, there is also the important rule of uh, getting uh, benefits. So when you gain a benefit during the game, whenever you gain a certain benefit, you may choose specifically to get a lesser benefit instead, because of course it will be more important for your uh, uh, immediate action. Uh, you are missing a specific thing that you need to fulfill in order to get a specific uh, uh, bonus or whatever, or gain specific cards. In any case, you can choose to get the lesser benefit if you're allowed. The hierarchy of benefits is this. First we place a monolith, a megalith, sorry, you can see here, this is the place megalith, this is also indicating uh, the turn of lesser benefits. So place a megalith, draw a card, then gain one idol, then gain one tool, or gain one food. So what do I mean? If I am allowed to gain one idol, and I don't want to gain one idol for any reason, because I'm really uh, missing a food and it will uh, cause more damage or a tool, then I can decide to get a lesser benefit instead. It's up to me. 
but it's important that I cannot trade one for the other during the game, only at the point where I'm gaining something I can choose not to gain the better benefit, but the lesser if I choose so. The food truck limit, which is here on the player board. This is important because uh, this limits the amount of food you can have on your player board. This increases as you place more and more uh, camps on the board. We'll see how this is done by placing more camps. Then you increase the capacity of uh, food that you can uh, go. So this is a cap. Your cap is the amount of um, the more camps you put, the more space you allow yourself for potentially getting more food. Uh, the same will go. Uh, the same happens with the tools, but the, the tools is a fixed uh, track. It goes all the way up to five. You cannot get more than five compared to the food, where you can gain more if you free these positions. The villages have nothing to do with the tools. At any point during the game, uh, there are two icons that you may be of interest to you. One icon can be to gain one point directly, and one icon is to gain a point at the end of the game. So when you see points like that, victory points with a black background color, 1, 10, that means, or on the, on, uh, the sacred stones, you see, this is uh, on black background or brown background, that means that you'll gain those points at the end of the game. If this uh, background, the same goes with the cards, you see cards award you different points at the end of the game. If for any reason you have a light uh, brown background, not a dark brown, then you gain the points immediately and move your score track accordingly on the track within the game and not at the end of the game like you would do uh, normally. Now, let's move to the action phase. Starting with the first player that you can see here, this is the turn order. Each player will take a turn with a specific uh, flow and then will proceed in turn order uh, to uh, the next player accordingly. Until uh, this will be followed if all players have three turns. So I'm going to take a turn, the next player according to the turn order is going to take a turn, the next one, the next one, then back to me. This is going to continue around the table until I have three turns in total. On your turn, you complete the following steps in the specific order. It may sound uh, busy or uh, confusing, but it's extremely simple. Once you get it to do it once, that's out of it. You immediately make it your own. The first thing you do, and you don't have to remember anything by heart, because as I mentioned, everything is here on your player aid. So the first thing that you need to do is you can play 0, 1 or 2 cultural cards from your hand. We don't start with any cultural cards, as you can see. Actually, we start with an altar. This is a cultural card, so my mistake. Uh, but the cultural cards are essentially not the tribes, because the tribes have the icon that you'll see, or say uh, if they belong to a tribe member. Okay, so you can choose to play zero, one or two maximum cultural cards, either from the ones you have or the ones that you'll be getting through the game, you're going to acquire various cultural cards. This is an example of a cultural card you can see here, the scouting. The cultural cards represent different uh, advancements, technologies and things you unlock throughout your development of your tribe. So you get to know more things like stone spears, uh, funeral pyres, uh, scrapping, hides, tracking, fire, you develop fire, you invent fire, burial mounds, etc. So these are the cultural and always the bottom, uh, the second and third row always have cultural cards. These ones are tribe members, but they are decks. These are single cards that you're going to get from the respective deck. Now, moving back to my action phase. The first thing that I can do, I play zero, one or two cultural cards uh, from my hand. When I play those cards, say for example I had this card and it gives me a benefit of two precious tools that I need to do something else later on, uh, I'm going to move actually this a bit low so you can see uh, where I'm placing the cards. So there are some slots for your uh, player board. You see on the left, as we mentioned, we have the drawing deck. On the right is the discard. Here we have the animals that we're going to be uh, hunting. Here are the burial site where we bury cards for victory points at the end of the game. Here's the eclipse zone where we put cards uh, face down for the eclipse that we're going to mention later. And here are the cards that we play uh, during the actions, for example, or uh, as culture cards at this stage. So at the stage one, I play zero, one or two culture cards here so I can gain this benefit immediately. For example, here I would gain two 
tools. The idea is that I get precious bonuses. Keep in mind those cards are not discarded, they're part of your uh, deck, meaning that they go to your discard pile later on and then are reshuffled and uh, then are potentially available again for next rounds. And of course they award victory points at the end, so you're not wasting them, okay? So this slot here, there is a bracket, is for playing um, respectively 0, 1 or 2 culture cards that you can play. So this is legal. I can play those and get to do this conversion, this action and gain two bonuses. The iconography is very very simple. It is explained extremely well at the end of uh, the rulebook but of course you'll see that uh, uh, you will uh, make it your own and you'll understand very quickly once you play the game. I'm not replenishing at this stage. I just replenish so that you have a visual. Uh, these are going to be replenished later on. So no replenishing when I play cards or when I buy cards from here. Uh, those cards I must have them in my hand to play them here. Okay, the second stage is I can place one figure and perform actions. So I select one of those figures and I place it in one of the spots here or on my player board. This is a spot I'm going to explain later or I can place it here to perform any of those actions that we're going to explain later on through the game. And then I can discard the played cards. I take the played cards that I have here, either uh, culture cards or uh, cards that I have played through the actions. So for example, through the actions of the game, I may have played from my hand in this playing area again, tribe members or different cards to boost my action. We'll explain how this uh, locks and um, works in synergy. And then I discard it because I finished. The third stage is uh, to discard the cards. And the fourth stage is uh, which is essentially, it is very important, is to place, to place Eclipse Pile. So I can place cards here from my hand, face down, either tribe members or culture cards that are going to count in this section, only the first slot, for uh, later on for the uh, Eclipse phase, which is here, okay? So the last thing I can do is I can save cards for the Eclipse pile. So this is the sequence. I'm reminding you the action phase is play 0 to 2 culture cards, place one figure and perform actions, discard playing cards and then perform uh, inserting in the slot of the Eclipse some cards to prepare gradually your Eclipse pile for the Eclipse phase later on. A few quick words for each of these uh, uh, stages. So when I play culture cards, I, the cards themselves represent, as I said, craft technologies or cultural events of my tribe, excellence, inventions, etc. So I pay zero, one or two cultural cards from your hand, then I gain the benefit and I place it in this section here on the top right of my player board. After I have done, I resolve the events, the conversions or the benefits or the bonuses, uh, then these cards are placed to the discard pile here. Now, the second thing that I do in my turn is to place a figure and perform actions. And this is one of the core mechanics of the game, the worker placement. The game has beautiful worker placement plus deck building and these are the two strong mechanisms of the game that they work smoothly. Now let's see how placing a figure works. You place one of your remaining figures, either chief or tribe figures. So you can place either a tribe figure or a chief figure, depending on what you want to position in one of the available locations. So you can either place it on the top of one of the columns, here, 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 or here, or on your player board here, which is a worker spot. Now, this is the eclipse action on your worker, uh, on your player board. Let's explain first the main board, which is the core of the game. Each action column is divided in three sections. You see, there are three uh, there are four columns and each of the columns is divided in three sections. We have the top section, the middle section and the bottom section. The same goes for the second, third and fourth column. Top, middle, bottom. Top, middle, bottom. So when I choose a column, I will uh, perform this sequence. I will place it first of all on the top of uh, the column and I will perform as many as I want from the actions located on the top. So I can perform that in this section and I can uh, carry any number of uh, these actions, even zero, and then I move below to carry the middle section, and then I move here, and if I'm the first to place it in a column, then I get to place it here and take the bonus. So the bonus is only for the first player to go in a column. 
So the sequence is very simple. I select a column, I place it to the left of the section, then I carry out any of the actions depicted on the top section. Each of these actions may be carried in any uh, number of times and in any order as depicted in the infinity icon here. So I can do it as many times as I want. I can give two, uh, two times two, four labor, uh, produ produce four labor with my cards or my tokens and then do two times this effect. Then I move to the second section. I can do it as many times as I want. Give tools to bury a card in my burial site that we're going to explain later on. And then finally I move my figure to the bottom section. And as I said, if I'm the first player to do this during this round, I may then carry out the action there as well by placing the figure on the action icon to show that it's no longer available. If I'm not the first player, I place the figure in the large space below. So the first player does it here. And if a second player comes, for example, they perform this one, they perform that one, and then they go, they go here, but they don't perform the bonus here. So this is only for the first player, this section. This is the general section where everyone is then going to end up, but not going to get the bottom bonus. Now, keep in mind that the presence of a figure in an action column does not prevent another player to come in. The only negative is that the bottom section is going to be uh, blocked, meaning that they're not going to take the bonus of the bottom section. Most actions cost a certain amount of labor, as you have seen. Uh, so, for example, I can generate labor by playing any number of tribe cards from my hand. Keep in mind that uh, I have five cards in my hand at when I start the game. And uh, I draw five cards each time, so I can have more cards later on. So, uh, I can play cards from my hand in the play area here to generate labor icons. So, for example, I can play three tribe members from my starting cards, so I generate three labor icons. If I play four, I can generate four labor icons. And for example, I can spend them here if I was the blue player and coming here, like before, to perform twice this action. And then here, spend uh, tools respectively. So cards is the main source of producing labor icons as they are depicted here. Keep in mind that your chieftain also has, your chief also has one labor icon that they can produce when they go in a position themselves as an icon. So if I bring it here, I have one additional labor and this, this is indicated here. Or if I bring it here in the, the Eclipse action, it has one plus two, three that we're going to explain later on. Okay, so there you have it. So far, the main source of uh, labor icon, uh, icons are generated from cards. Keep in mind that uh, you can have uh, additional actions that give abilities and produce added labor. For example, if I, I was producing from my hand on top of, say I produced three labor icons by playing three cards and I wanted to have four to make this action twice. And if in my hand, I also had this, that means that this card produces an added icon labor when I'm using it during this action because it has the action for the first column. Other specific tribe members, this one, they produce one for the second column. The hunter, as you can understand, they produce plus one labor for the hunting action and so on. So depending on where I'm placing uh, my tribe member, tribe figure, if I contribute the correct tribe members, I get added labor actions, uh, icons that I need to perform the various actions. You may also spend food for added labor, but this is uh, just as a last resort if you really want it, uh, as, or maybe you can optimize for it, as uh, you produce it from your, as you have it available from your food truck. So, so you spend as much as you want by moving the marker food back, so one labor, two labor, Free labor. You can see the labor icons that they are here, but keep in mind if I'm here, then I don't produce unless I move here. Okay, so depending on the barrier, when I move down, I produce a more labor icon if I spend more food from my food truck. For each labor icon my marker passes, I gain one added labor. So I can contribute labors again from cards 
from special abilities of special tribe members and from my food track respectively. So it could be valid that I need, for example, five labors for something for performing a specific action and I can give, uh, let's say, for example, I was coming here to perform this action and I need to generate in my plants five labor actions. I can give two if I produce this card because, uh, sorry, I can give uh, only one if I produce this card here. It doesn't give a second one because it needs to be here in the mountain. So I would produce one only. So if I wanted to play four here and I contributed one card from here, one icon plus one, two. So one on its own plus one because I played on the hunt column, two. Plus, uh, let's say I contributed one tribe member, three. And I can spend two food if I was here, one and one, two, to make it five and then take two times uh, this action plus one time this action in total for five labor uh, icons produced. So I can pick and choose whatever I want depending on my hand, my strategy and my resources. Now, the last uh, thing that I want to explain is when I do the action, remember, I select that I, I told you that I take one of my figures and either put it on a column, perform the column action, and then I end up here or here, depending if I'm the first player, and then uh, goes the play goes to the next player uh, clockwise. Oh, sorry, on turn order. Either I position the play the token on a column or on my main board on this section here, which is the Eclipse one. I don't know if you can see it, it has a, a, a little um, humanoid icon. So if I position it here and I can get more than one miniatures here. So for example, I can send a second one and make this action twice. So I, uh, there's no problem of uh, sending a second one here, okay? On this, my player board. So when I do that, I uh, immediately get to perform the Eclipse action on my player board. I draw one card, as you can see here, that's the draw icon. So I draw one card from my deck, add it to my hand. And of course, the next thing that I can do is I can, uh, uh, pre uh, I'm preparing essentially for the eclipse that's coming down because each worker sitting here, each figure sitting here, contributes two uh, labor icons for calculating the most labor icons for the eclipse phase, which is something different and uh, it's played after the action phase on the eclipse phase. So the presence of the figure there does not prevent you from putting more figures. And then once you have done this, you need to discard. So you place all the cards above your player board. Every card that you have played here, it goes to your discard pile. Again, this is my chief. I need to take it a bit higher so it's not confusing. So for example, this is my discard pile. Any cards that I have played here in my play area, I move it to the discard pile respectively. So this is how uh, the discard phase works. Essentially, whatever I played, I move it here. Now, if this is my third turn of the round, I get to keep cards, to place cards for the eclipse phase. I only do it if this is my third turn. So I cannot do it on my first turn, not on the second turn. If this is my third turn, meaning I have positioned my third figure, that's the, when my third turn is, then whatever cards I have not played, I can choose to optimize them, to put them here or keep them during my previous turns to have them after my third turn and place them here for the eclipse phase. So essentially here I will have a pile on this specific slot with uh, uh, face down cards that they go on this slot only for my Eclipse phase. Now, this is done again only if I just played my third figure. So I may now place any number of culture and tribe cards. So I can either place culture cards from my hand here or tribe members that I have in my hand here, face down. All players uh, will have this um, section with face down cards. Any cards you do not place on the Eclipse pile remain in your hand for the next turn. So you have more cards on the next turn and make more meaningful turn. And after your turn is over, the next player's turn is over and then the next player's turn is over. And then we continue to the Eclipse phase where everyone is going to have an Eclipse pile ready waiting here. Now, we're going to explain the different spots of what the different sections do, but let's move to the Eclipse phase for the moment. 
During the Stone Age period, astronomical phenomena like eclipses define the change of generation, and that's why after each generation, each round, we have an eclipse phase indicating that we will change a generation. The game is played on four rounds slash four generations. Now, these magnificent events were interpreted as spiritual signs and resulted in a lot of activity and competition among tribes, and at the end of this phenomena, a new generation took over and serenity returned. During the eclipse phase and each eclipse phase, we have to complete the following steps. First of all, all players simultaneously reveal their eclipse piles. Remember this pile? We have prepared with ve uh, putting various tribe cards or uh, um, culture cards to contribute here. All players reveal their eclipse piles and compare the labor totals. You get a total of different labor contribution for your eclipse phase that resulting from two labors per figure. So if I have two figures here, for any reason, I would get four contribution in my labor total. Labor icons revealed on tribe cards. For example, I will get four, five, six if I have those two cards. And I also get half a labor for each uh, tribe cultural card that I have. So with only one, I will have four, five, six, six and a half. That's my number. If I had two culture cards, I'll have seven, respectively. So this is how I calculate my total for the eclipse phase, how I contribute to my eclipse phase. You cannot spend food for added labor for this stage, so you forget about food if you had any to spend. And each number is going to have a total. The player with the most um, labor in total moves their turn order marker to the top position. So, for example, if this was the blue and before if they were fourth, in turn order, or third or second, they would move all the way to the top. So they will be first for the next turn. We arrange the turn order with the same principle for the remaining players, depending on the total value of contribution in labor during this eclipse phase. And if there are any ties, ties are broken um, in favor of the player who went later in the current round. So there is compensation essentially. Now. The third thing that we do, in turn order, each player performs the following actions with a specific turn order. And again, you don't have to remember everything. You see the eclipse phase is here, so the section is described here very, very uh, nicely. So the first thing we do is in turn order, the new turn order that was just established, we gain the benefit shown beside the order marker. So I can gain any of those benefits. Remember, I can gain a lesser benefit if I choose to. Okay? But the first player can get either one, that, 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 it has a full selection. The fourth player can only get a two or a food. Okay. Then the player board is changed, meaning, meaning that we gain any eclipse phase benefits shown or on our player board and the eclipse benefits are indicated here. So if at some point I have a village and I'm going to explain how I place villages uh, in the main board through the game in intersections respectively. Uh, when at some point I have a village, this is going to be empty. When I have placed through the game my megaliths, I will have some icons here revealed. So all of those icons revealed beneath all the sections contribute to my income, let's say from the eclipse phase, which means essentially I'm going to gain all those that they are revealed. Then we perform the eclipse actions shown on each tribe card in my eclipse pile, one card at a time, discarding the card after we perform the action, and any cultural cards in my eclipse pile are simply moved to the discard pile if they don't contribute. So for example, some of the cultural cards that I have here, uh, they may give me something during eclipse. Keep in mind that the basic tribe members, they contribute something, you see? In eclipse, I will have this opportunity to do that. In eclipse, I can place a new camp and gain two food for example if i'm not mistaken i'll check on the appendix later on so you can understand that this is very very important because you have contributed this card during eclipse besides the icon that they contribute they will give me something during the eclipse phase at this stage and it's very very important and last but not least i will gain the benefits from each terrain tile where you have the most influence or are tied for the most influence meaning that if here for example we are either tied or I have more, 
the blue player, I will gain two victory points now because this is in a, in a light brown victory point token. So I will gain one, two victory points here. Different uh, tiles may give different things. For example, this uh, in during eclipse it gives me two food, or one two, or for example, uh, different uh, uh, gain one idol, etc. Depending on what it's depicted. Same goes here. Gain one idol. So, each player ha will perform this uh, in turn order and then we'll move to the next player and when the last player in turn order has completed their Eclipse actions all players discard all the cards from their Eclipse, eclipse action, Eclipse uh, section together with the discard pile on the right. So, district Eclipse section, district playing area, draw pile, discard pile animals and burial site. I'm going to explain later on. There are various player board benefits that we gain as we remove megaliths and villages from our player board. I reveal additional benefits that I will be gaining during my eclipse phase. So for each village I remove, I gain the uncovered benefit and these are explained with iconography very very simple. Here for example I think I draw a card and uh, this is an animal card that's why it has a fur. Is it? don't remember, I'll check, it's in the index. In any case, uh, I need to refresh my memory on the icons and you gain those benefits during the Eclipse. And for example, the same will go with uh, the respective lower section here. You can gain one tool during an Eclipse. This is the Eclipse. And if you have uh, removed for every four additional, because this is the two first one are the gray ones, every uh, second, third are on the player color megaliths. If you have removed four additional megaliths, then you may bury a card. And this is a bury card. So essentially you can take a card and one of your cards that you have in your hand and you can bury it here for victory points at the end, for example. Okay? But this is because I have a bury card as an income during my eclipse phase. So, the last thing that we do is we prepare for uh, the next phase. I'm going to explain it in a bit. We prepare, we prepare for the next phase. Essentially, if this is uh, the final round, we'll skip this phase, only in the previous rounds. We advance the round to round number two, for example. We return all figures to the respective positions, so they go out from the worker placement spots. The same goes for the chieftain uh, mini, which is a worker. Then we return any cultural cards with labor tokens on them at the bottom of the labor uh, token uh, supply. We place one labor token on each of the remaining face up. So if we had any with a labor token on them, we would return any cultural cards with labor tokens on them to the bottom of their deck. So this is going to go on the bottom of the respective deck below here. Any remaining cards, cultural cards that is, they would going to get one labor token, so they are more essentially uh, uh, challenging to, um, to get them because they offer one more labor. Once this is done, uh, if this is the end of the first round, we refill any empty spaces with cultural cards drawn again from the era one deck. But if this is uh, moving forward in the third round, when after the second one is finished, then we'll move this card here to block this deck and we'll start refilling at this section with ERA 2 cultural cards which are more advanced and give more benefits. Each player draws 5 cards from the draw pile and adds them to their hand and that's the end of the preparation of the preparation phase and we move to the next round. Now, briefly, let me touch what are the locations but are very 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 simple. So first of all, we have the develop action, which has the develop icon here, and these are the actions here. Now the top section shows that uh, you spent, sorry, that's not the develop, this is the initiate action. This is the develop action. So this is the initiate action, which means that the top section you spent two labors that you produce from your cards, from your uh, other resources, if you have tokens, etc. Uh, you spent two labors to essentially take the top one face-up tribe card from below the board. You take two, you spend two labor cards 
to take one of the face-up drive cards from below the main board and you can place it in your hand. If you use this action multiple times on the same turn, if you spend four labor tokens to gain two cards, you must take two different drive cards. So this is one option, this is one option, this is one option, this is one option and this is one option. This is how I gain the top tribe members and add them uh, to my uh, hand. So one important aspect that needs to be noti noticed is with the cards I take during this phase, I immediately take them to my hand and they are available to be used immediately for the subsequent turns, for the subsequent turns uh, in this round. So keep in mind that uh, compared to other deck builders, which I think this is one great uh, aspect, where you take the card and you put it in your discard pile and you're waiting that it's reshuffled here and then redraw it and you forget about it. <laughs> you immediately take the cards, not in the top of your card for next turn, in your hand so that you can use it immediately. This is a brilliant way to move uh, the, the pace of the game uh, fast and efficiently. So, if I take more than one, if I pay four or six to gain two or three, I need to take different ones from the top row. This is the tribe members. Now, the middle section here means that I spent uh, one tool from my tool track, so I reduce my tools by one, and then I bury one tribe card, meaning that uh, essentially I take one of my, my cards, tribe or culture, from my hand, and I put it here in the burial side. This is a burial icon. So I put them buried here and they are not locked here. I can always look at them, but I cannot use them again. And they are counted for victory points at the end of the game. Uh, I can do this multiple times by paying more tools, of course. And the bottom section, if I'm the first figure to go in this column, and I take the bottom section that you can see here, uh, I bury one card and gain one idol. So I get to do one more uh, burial from my hand and take one idol, which I can select any of the two tracks and move forward my track, uh, my token upwards. We'll explain that idols later on. This was the initiate column, the initiate action. The initiate action has this icon. And this is the develop action or develop column, where I gain cultural cards and gain sacred stone tiles. So the top section here, I can produce three idols, uh, labor icons, essentially uh, to uh, take up a face uh, culture card. So this was the culture card token that I was uh, referring to here. Yeah, this is a culture card iconography, not the animals. The animals have the paw. Yeah, that makes sense. So I can pay three or produce three or show three from my hand on cards that I play here to gain one culture card from any of those. Or I can give six or produce six to gain two, etc. This middle section, which is here, I pay the respective cost indicated in here, in the slots, so that I can uh, work with sacred stones. I take one or more sacred stone tiles from a supply pool of the current round or a previous round. This is the first round, so I have access to those three in a four player game or those two in a two or three player game. So I can, if we're in the first round, I can select any of those. If we're in the second round, I can select any one of those that are still in their position. So I can take any one of those, pay the resource indicated on the left one. So I start from the leftmost. So here I need to pay one tool and one food. I need to pay more as I move forward. And then I gain uh, this idol, which is scoring opportunity only for me. And I gain one idol here. This is a sacred stone, scoring opportunity only for me. And I gain again one idol and I move in one of, you know, any of those idol tracks, one upwards. And I install it here to indicate that at the end of the game, I'm going to score this amount of points. This is specific for me and uh, no one else can score this type of uh, sacred stone. I can even gain more if I can spend more resources to do so. Now, the last thing that you can do here, which is the bottom one, you draw one card and gain one two. That has the draw card icon and gain one two. So I draw one card in my hand and gain one two in my tool track, respectively. The third column, which is here, and it is a migrate column, the migrate action, I place camps, I move camps and I place villages. So it plays with this area here. The top section, which is this one, and has 
two different things. I spent one labor to place the leftmost camp from my player board on the base terrain tile, so here, in the middle of the map. I always place them here, unless I have special abilities. Then I may perform this action multiple times by paying more labor, so I can pay another labor, produce another labor from my cards, and place a second one, or whatever, it's up to me. And then I also increase my food capacity, storage. I can also spend or produce labor tokens to move one of my camps, and I want to expand. So I can spend additional labor tokens to move one labor token, two labor tokens, three, four, by producing them always with played cards in my play area. And the reason I want to place and move uh, camps is to gain, during Eclipse, different resources, income, etc. If I have a, a tie or the majority presence in a section, in a map tile. Now, the middle section, which is here, I can spend as many times as I want three food from my food truck. One, two, three. And then what I can do is this specific action that I need to show you so that you can uh, see it. If I have at least one, let's say this was one example, for the, at this uh, crossroad, at this point, with this meeting point, not uh, at, at the edges of one of the hexes, if I have presence in all their surrounding areas from my camps, one camp here, one camp here, and one camp here, I can pay free food to take the leftmost village, place it here, and remove one, two, three, and put them back here. Keep in mind that they go back here so they again tighten your food storage accordingly. But then I have a village in this section. And this is important because uh, uh, it gives me the flexibility to have some benefits. Keep in mind that the base terrain tile cannot be one of the three terrains chosen. So you cannot place a village here and take one of those uh, tiles from the base. You need to be outside the base tile. And this is how you place villages. Now immediately you may ask what is the importance of villages and why do we want to put villages in these sections? Each return camp, each camp on the present uh, map tile contributes one influence. So here, for example, they both have one, one, one. They are tied, okay? Uh, they both win the eclipse phase, so okay. In any case, uh, if I was like that and the other player had one more, okay? So it's two versus one. The orange player is winning the tie. It has two influence versus one. But what the village does is it's contributing two influence on each adjacent spaces. So it's like having two camps here already without having any. So two, two, two. So if this was here and I was like that, the blue player was going to win the influence for this income during Eclipse, meaning one victory point. Because he has, the orange has one, two, and the blue has two for the village, plus one, three. And again, the two contribution for the influence goes simultaneously to all the three adjacent corners, which is very important. Now, the last uh, action that you can have is the hunt action with the hunt icon here. Basically, you draw, gain, and tough animal cards. So for the top section, hey, I forgot to mention the bottom uh, section, sorry, in the previous uh, column, in the migrate. So for the bottom section, you place one new camp on the base terrain tile, and then move one of your camps following the same rules. So it's essentially the same uh, it's a combined action, one plus one together. And it's only for the first player to put in one of the columns as usual. Now, the hand action that goes here, in the first top, uh, in the top uh, section of uh, the column, you spend one labor to place the leftmost camp, uh, sorry, you, place, uh, you spend one labor to place the top card of the animal deck here, uh, in the animal display, so you gain you put more cards in the display. So I put one labor to draw one more card. I spend one more labor to draw one more card. And I see more cards here for options for me to gain. Then I can also perform this as many times as I want, but I can also spend two labor cards, the uh, icons from produced labor icons from my play area to gain one card. So I gain one card. Then I take whatever card I want 
and I put it below this section. If I pay six, for example, I can gain three cards here below and they are not tapped as you can see. I can do this multiple times. If there are no animals in the display, I cannot take this action. Animals that they go in the section of the animals, they remain um, face up unless you do the tap action, tip action. So the middle section that you do following here is at this stage, you may tip any number of upright animal cards below your player board, so you have access to those. You can choose any, when, any of those that you want, tip them as you can see on the iconography to produce food because you want food and you're missing food. This is not ideal because uh, when you tip a card then it stays like that and it doesn't count for the set collection but you may burning for some food and you may need to do it. You do it during this middle section. If it's tapped it doesn't count, uh, tipped it doesn't count for the set collection. And then moving to the last one if you're the first one to be in this spot you do also the bonus and the bonus of course at the bottom section is to take the top card from the animal deck and place it face up below your player board directly. So you immediately take one of those cards and put it here face up directly. Well, that was lucky enough. Okay, so uh, this is how I acquire uh, animals essentially. And uh, you'll see that uh, if they're not uh, used for food, if I have three of those like in this example, they will give me six points. And that's good because I gain a lot of points for set collection of this specific animal or for each animal for that reason. Now, a couple of quick rules about the uh, general ideas about the megaliths that we didn't explain here and the idle board. Now, when you gain uh, the effect of uh, uh, depicting a megalith, for example here, or through other course of uh, actions through the cards or the game, what I do is uh, I may place one of my megaliths from my board onto the megalith board here to construct the mega structure. Each megalith must be placed on either a starting space these are the starting spaces that you can see with the red uh, or orthogonally adjacent to another megalith for example here here or here or stacked on top of two megaliths halfway covering them so it could go like that for example covering those here sorry it's difficult to do with one hand but covering those like that and then of course another time you can also put on top of those and reach another level as well so it's up to you to decide if you go for the bottom ground floor or stack on top of others in any case the first two megaliths you place must be the neutral ones because we first place the gray ones that you see here go from left to right each megalith you place on uh, uh, the board itself you gain the immediate benefit for example if I put it here again one tool two tools but I need to follow the rules idols you see at the edges of these cards animal cards draw cards draw to um, uh, gain one tribe member etc draw, get to food different things and different bonuses each megalith you place on an upper level stacked on top of other megaliths like those will give you victory points at the end of the game at the final scoring and we'll explain at the final scoring the last thing I want to explain is the idol board here. Each time you gain an idol, you immediately move your marker one level up, either here or here. So whenever I gain the idol, here for example, I have three idols. I can either do one, two, three, or I can do one, two, three. It's up to me. If you gain more than one idol, that is. The position of your marker on the offering track, this on the left is the offering track, and this is the honor track, the honor track at the, the right. Honor track and offering track. So the offering track on the left determines the value of your unspent, unspent food and tools at the end of the game. So for example, if I'm here and I finish the game like that, I have a specific amount of tools and food. Right, if I have this specific amount of food and tools, that means that I can get different amount of victory points for each of those depending on the tier that I have reached. So for example, if I'm here, Every three of those combination, two, meat, two, meat, uh, two food and one tool or three food or three tool or whatever, any combination of three of those will give me one victory point. If I'm still here, any combination of four of those. 
if I'm here in combination of two and here any combination each of those respectively on its own gives one victory point which is the best and if I gain more idle on this track for each gained idle I gain one additional victory point and this is the offering track and on the right you have your uh, honor track which is uh, relative to other players and determines the value of your buried cards remember when we are burying cards here we have different amount of cards buried here with the burying card action uh, when you move your marker up on the on, on the honor track you're gaining the edge compared with your uh, opponents so you're going to have different uh, level depending compared to your opponent so when you move your marker up on the honor track place it on the leftmost vacant space so if this guy goes higher they go on the left to indicate that they are the first reaching this one if this goes then again they're going to go here okay now when your marker enters one of the top three levels immediately you gain the points depicted so you can gain one plus two three plus three up to six points if you pass all these three sections and reach all the way to the tenth at the end of the game this is going to give you victory points depending on the number of um, victory uh, cards that you have so the first player the one that they are higher in this case even the type he's on the left the orange one they're going to score with this condition the second one with this condition and the third one with this condition so they're going to get different amount of victory points of course the first one are going to gain more victory points for their buried cards respectively so that's it it's the final summary for the scoring if it is now the time to determine who has the most prosperous tribe by adding everyone's final points, what you do is you receive uh, victory points calculating what you have gathered through the game from the score track and then you move forward with uh, the remaining cards that you're going to win. The remaining victory points which they are sourced from the, from the following things. Sacred stone tiles, offering track, honor track, tribe and cultural cards, animal cards, stack megaliths so whatever i scored throughout the game plus points from the idol track either honor uh, offering or honor track tribe cards and tri and cultural cards that award different victory points also different set collections for animals that they are not tipped give me victory points and the last thing that i also gives me victory points is of the the mega structures from the stacked Megaliths. So let's see how the Megaliths score. Uh, as you can see, the Megaliths of your player color that are higher than other Megaliths of your own color are worth points which follow this sequence. For each level, you multiply the number of Megaliths that you are on that level by the number of all of your Megaliths on lower levels, whether you're touching them or not. And of course, neutral Megaliths do not count for points. So for example, we have third level, second level and ground level. So on the third level, this one counts as one, because I don't have any other one, times one, two, three, four on lower levels. So one times four, four points for this one. Those two on the second level, they are two times only one, that's below, plus one, two. So two times two actually, two are on the lower level than this second level, two times two, that's four points again. And uh, the ones on the ground floor, uh, on the uh, touching exactly the board of uh, the megalith structure, give zero points. So as you can see, this is a very very clever way to multiply your uh, megaliths in a clever way to gain a lot of victory points. Uh, but the only difference is that when you're first putting a new megalith, if you're touching a bonus, you take the bonus. If they're touching on top of uh, other megaliths, they are just multipliers, as I have explained just now. Now the last thing to explain are the chief cards these have a, a side that they indicate that they contribute one labor icon when they are played uh, forget about the bottom this is the ability they all of them contribute on one labor icon when their actual mini is placed on the board so for example if this mini is placed on a specific column uh, providing the action of that column for example here okay you cannot see it but uh, they contribute one labor and of course they also have an ability that uh, counts as an extra ability for that chief specifically other uh, chief cards provide different abilities for different 
uh, sections, different columns of the main board. In any case, this is how the chief card and cards work, and this concludes all the rules for playing Endless Winter. I read summarize. The scoring comes from adding all the different uh, victory points that you already gathered through the game, plus sacred stone tiles, offering track, honor track, tribe and culture cards which have points on themselves as well, the animal cards for set collection, and last, the multipliers that you get from stacked megaliths. And this is how you play Endless Winter. Wow! 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 This is an amazing game! The first time it was explained to me on the TTS, Tabletop Simulator, I was with uh, my mate, with my friend, and we were saying both to ourselves, wow, this, this, this is great, I can't wait to try it actually on the table. And we were hearing the rules and we were hearing the different things. My initial thoughts that were that there are so many specific uh, areas that you can focus, the map, uh, the development, uh, the megaliths, the mega structures, or the sacred stones, or the idols, tracks, etc. Your deck building, how you customize your deck, how you gather a set collection with uh, the various animals, etc. And I was saying, oh my god, this looks so great. This is amazing, that is amazing, this makes sense. Okay, but at the initial stage, I was thinking that there were so many great things scattered around. After the first round, the first generation, everything clicked together smoothly. Everything made sense, thematically as well, because so far, from the rules explanation, when I heard the rules for the first time, I was thinking they're, they're great, but they look like uh, independent things that I need to focus on. But within the first uh, generation, everything started to make sense, everything blended smoothly, and everything was working as a charm. It's brilliant. This game is top of the top, the cherry on, on the top, the cream uh, of the cream, or whatever, you, you name it. It's a great game. If you are into cleverly designed, fast-paced, medium-heavy, this is not a heavy game, but has a lot of depth through strategy and options, Euro-style games with several splashes of freshness and innovation, then look no more, this is your game. I'm sure this game is going to be super successive, uh, successful even in the retail. It's going to be one of those games that are going to be out of stock as soon as they are back in stock because people that they actually going to play the game, they're going to be the best promoters for how good this game is. I'm so happy to be part of this, uh, just trying the game, giving my opinion, giving some initial feedback, testing it on uh, uh, TTS and even making this video because I really want to support this game due to the fact that I think all the love and all the detail and all the careful designing both from the designing team the development team which are great actually and their publishers and designers themselves designers themselves and the actual team of uh, uh, the publishers from Fradesia games are really really the best you could pick if you tell me come nominate some people to make a new game which ones would you pick from the industry i would pick this guy for the art that guy from the gaming designing uh, pool and this guy for development. So Fantasia G Games managed to pull the unbelievable trick. They came out of nowhere and made this fantastic game. It's already a success. The thing is, if you want to be part of the success, you better hurry and join the Kickstarter campaign page and find out for yourself how great a game is that you will be proud to have in your collection. I would definitely be, be proud and they will be somewhere back here uh, in, in, the, um, in my bookcase in my library because this is one of the best games I would have in my possession. Easily, easily in my top 10. Of course I want to play the different modules that they have announced. They look so fascinating. The river, uh, the paintings, the cave paintings, the different expansions, the different, uh, uh, all this different material. But besides that, this game on its own is a gem, a true gem. On top of that, if you put the clever uh, mechanisms, the great production value, the added value from the add-ons, this is a no-brainer. This is a keeper and one of the games that you will be hanging on for lots and lots of years to come. So, hope you enjoyed this video. We'll come back with another playthrough video at some point to show you how we actually have fun playing the game and so that you get a better understanding of uh, the actual playthrough, the actual uh, uh, turns when we play them. So, hope you enjoyed this video. Till next time, many thanks for watching. Check out the description for a link for the Kickstarter campaign page. Hi, and take care and really play such great games like this one. This is a game that I really would have liked to have now before going into lockdown in the quarantine. But in any case, I still have the prototype for a couple of more sessions to play. Today I'm playing it again with my friends. So take care, till next time. Thanks for watching. <laughs>